Greetings, welcome to Lansing Online News Radio. This is Bonnie Buckaroo, soon to be joined by my co-host Bill Castanier, here at WLNZ 89.7 in Lansing, Michigan. Greetings, Bill. Good to see you. Good evening. I have been gone for a while, dealing with all sorts of pet problems. One of the things I did want to talk about is that, you know, what happens nowadays is that you find out that it isn't as if human insurance isn't bad enough. The cost of taking care of aging human pets is just enormous nowadays. I have heard some costs and prices that people have spent that are astronomical. That's stunning to me. I mean, we're now talking about geriatric care for pets and trying to hang on to them as long as possible. I knew my little dog had a return of some tumors, and I took her into the vet because she was looking mighty bad. And I figured that they would just palpate and see if she had some kind of recurrence. And they said, well, could we do an x-ray and some blood tests? And I thought, sure. Then I didn't realize that was $600 for x-ray and blood tests. And it's like, oh, hey, ouch, wait a minute. Uh, and then they were suggesting that maybe we could do a few more tests. And I'll Biopsy would only cost about $3,000. Uh, it's stunning. It's stunning. Yeah. So nowadays, you I mean, one of the things that worries me is that people don't realize the financial burden they're taking on when they get a pet. And when you're in a position right there with the veterinarian person right in a you know, lab area or something, you have to make that decision about whether or not to do it. That's I very know. difficult. I mean, no, I want to kill my animal. Right. I really don't care about this cat. I really don't care about this dog. I had to have two pets euthanized yeah, in the same uh, day. That man was about the only thing that might be as... People hate. We're gonna get caught. We're gonna get some people honest about this. <laughs> I tell you, um, is buying a, a casket. The Ooh. pressure to do those kinds of things is very difficult. This this is tough stuff. When my first husband died, I was dazzled that his parents wanted a casket that was the same color as his favorite suit. Now I thought that was a little odd. Did he like yellow? <laughs> It was a it was a metallic green. <laughs> oh good. Yeah. You didn't want to be buried in a fifty seven Chevy at least. <laughs> no. I kept thinking to myself, you're being upsold here <laughs> into this metallic green casket because it had the it was shiny like a suit. Mm. I want the kind of with LED lights. You know? Oh god. Oh wait, they bury it. Now no wonder we're seeing this whole green movement where people are going straight into the ground. Absolutely. Wooden ca I mean you can do wooden caskets too. Well, I live behind Leak Cemetery, and I always wonder about what's leaking in the morning. And they call that leak. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, L-E-E case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I did want to make sure that I mentioned tonight before I forget, Bill, is that um, Ray Holman of the UAW, who's been a frequent guest on that show, is very concerned about a whole battery, I think there's four of them, that, um, bills that are coming up in the legislature that would really defang the unions in this state. It would make it virtually impossible for them to do business as usual. Things like every year each person would have to uh, initiate signing a document that says that they want to be part of the union and that uh, companies would no longer have to deduct those dues from the uh, paychecks automatically, that kind of thing. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, January 31st at 12 noon, down at the Capitol, the Oversight, Reforms, and Ethics Committee is going to be hosting hearings on these in room 326. And I know that um, people from the public are really encouraged to get down there and uh, voice their concerns and sit in on these hearings and hear what the arguments are going to be on both sides. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of these bills are just another name for right to work. Right. It chips away at it all. It sure that. does. And I, I think if a right to work bill would pass, I think the governor would sign it. I'm afraid that he would, even though he keeps saying he doesn't want to see one. It seems to me that there are plenty of bills he says he doesn't want to see, but he signed them once they appear on his desk. By the way, I wanted to ask you, Bill, with President Obama's visit back here to Michigan at U of M the other day, we saw that when he landed on the tarmac in Arizona, Governor Jan Bullen went out there and shook her finger in his face for a while. Uh, what happened with Governor Snyder here? I think he sent him a message from his iPad. <laughs> <laughs> That's as close as he got. <laughs> so he kind of dissed him, didn't he? Yeah, no show. It seems to me that you might rearrange your schedule to have an opportunity to work that, with the that president. That is, but, you know, I think he saw it probably more as a campaign trip, even though maybe it wasn't technically. Yeah, yeah he's still the president whether he's but campaigning they don't, or not. They don't visit him if he's campaigning. Oh, I see. So well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so it, I mean, sure that, I'm sure that was part of the decision. Um, well, you're kinder to him. Oh, it's, him. yeah, I, I wouldn't expect him to. This is war. <laughs> well, we're seeing that in the GOP side. Tomorrow's going to be a big day. Down in Florida, what are your, what's your prediction? Though? Easy Mormon. Oh, really? You think so? Easy. Ah, new surgeon. <laughs> Last night it was the Mormon. <laughs> huh? No, no I mean, 
Yeah. It could. Yeah. You never know it's gonna. Because look at the way these have gone. I know. Within 24 hours, they flipped. So it could. It could be. But I think it's. I think it is definitely. Uh, well, the yeah. trick on these is that on any given day, there can be a swing of 10 to 20 points. So it's very surprising. Especially, Especially in that. primaries and states like that. I think the one thing that is a constant is we're seeing enormous amounts of money pumped in. According to the latest estimates, Mitt Romney's team, him and his super PAC, the super PAC he doesn't coordinate with, has spent $16 million. And Newt and his super PAC have only spent $4 million. So that's only $20 million of money that's gone to ads. I mean, no wonder the media likes to keep it a competitive system. It's Actually, that's why primaries, uh, states love primaries, is the media and all the visits and all the hoop going things. It's money. It is, absolutely. I, I wouldn't want to try to buy a TV time down there for Tom's TV store. Mm, yeah. It'd be pretty hard. I, I can't imagine. Grand what, opening of your new business? What the prices are. Yeah. Yes. Miami is expensive as it is, but all of the for media stations, that's the difference between them and some of the smaller states, is that media buys are so much more expensive. Well, Vermont, you buy one television station, <laughs> which is all run, also run as a screen door repair. Well, you know, that's one of the things that I did want to talk about, and it's a good segue into our first guest, is that years ago, when, in 2000, when I ran as the Green Party candidate, I had a whopping campaign budget of $1,100, I think it was, and uh, you don't get too many media buys for that. <laughs> so what happens is that you tend not to be invited to the debates that they're having, because until you can afford to have media buys, you can't reach the percentages necessary to be included. And that's one of the problems that we're seeing in so much of the kind of campaign coverage is that third parties, for example, are just completely ignored, it seems to me. Right. But you make a really good point. If third parties had a billion dollars to spend, they'd be everywhere. They would be. Then all of a sudden they'd be in on everything. Sure. It's about the money, how much money you can bring and put on the table. But it's when media player. companies are the ones that determine and negotiate a lot of the rules for the debates. Yes. It's clear that the paying customers get a better deal than the sort of ones who don't have the money to compete. Right. Better. Which is a good way of segueing into our first guest. Will White is here. Greetings, Will. Good to hear you. From you, Greetings. you're from the Libertarian Party of Michigan. Correct. Well, you were the, uh, you've been in the leadership in that party for quite a while, haven't you? Uh, I was the uh, state treasurer for a uh, few years and uh, on the uh, executive committee for about five. Also run uh, ran against uh, Mike Rogers in the 8th district for Congress. See, I ran against him too. Yeah, you do have something in common. Yeah. Right? How did you do? Uh, I think I got 2% of the vote. That's about what I got. So apparently, so, you know, <clears throat> but uh, we Green Party people were the ones in 2000s that were accused of getting Diane Byram in there. You were there at a different time. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, 2004, the last presidential election, the Green and the Libertarian parties teamed up to sue the state because their primary law was unconstitutional. Is that right? Yeah, and it was thrown out. And the vote was not uh, official. What was the change that was required? Well, they had, uh, it was kind of a technicality. They were going through all the, uh, after the primary vote, they were going to give all the data to the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Oh, okay. Um, so you couldn't share in the information the voters? Right. So oh. you were saying, hey, that should be available to anyone that wants it. It's public information and the court agrees. Well, you know, one of the questions I have right now is that Ron Paul, I think, is probably hands down the most uh, well-known libertarian. And is he in complete sync with the platform of the Libertarian Party? In other words, if I know what Ron Paul stands for, do I then know what the Libertarian Party stands for? Or are there differences that we should know about? Uh, basically, uh, any uh, Libertarian is on the same page. We have uh, principles, party of principle, and that principle is that you don't harm anyone else. Okay. Uh, when it's about personal liberty, it's a personal liberty issue and a small government issue. And if the uh, state exists to protect the rights of the individual, okay. and as long as you're not harming anyone else's individual rights, you have the, the uh, right, the inalienable right, as it says in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Mitt Romney keeps calling it unalienable. Yeah. I'm not really sure where he comes Well, unalienable <laughs> is actually Roswell. <laughs> it's spelled in the original. Oh, okay. Unalienable, unalienable, interchangeable. But they are rights given to us not from the government, but from our creator. 
Okay. And the government is there to protect those rights. Now, when so, the Libertarian Party says creator, do they have a particular creator in mind? No. Uh, you can. Uh, you can interpret that the way you interpret want to. Interpret it any way you want. Okay. Uh, Native Americans and all that. There's no tribes who uh, worship Mother Nature. Yeah. Mother Earth, Father, Son, uh, mm -hmm. whatever you want to put it. And they, of course, leave this to the uh, no religion. Uh, it really has nothing You'd to do You'd still with sneak it. us in? Yeah. Good, good. It's all it has to do with personal rights. Uh, uh, there are, you know, minor details that any uh, person might disagree about, just like in any party, um, as far as, you know, abortion rights. Well, that's the one that I wondered about. Military because... interventionism and things like that. But basically, the government is there to protect us, to defend our country, and protect the individual rights. The question is, where do the individual's rights start for a fetus? And of course, right now, uh, the court definition is at birth, when it's able to live outside the body on its own. So, Ron Paul is very uh, vocally pro life as opposed to pro choice. And I right. had always felt that the Libertarian Party was pro choice. And I was surprised that uh, that's where one of those areas where are you sort of, that's something that's still being worked out within the party as to where you draw that line? Well, most libertarians say it's a decision that should be left up to the person and the doctor. Okay. A private decision between the doctor and the, and the patient. And that says uh, the government has no responsibility to interrupt that. You know, it's really up to you, your religion, your family, your doctor. Okay. But uh, Ron Paul's official position is it's up to the states. There should not be a federal law regulating that law. Just like his uh, stance on the Department of Education. It didn't exist before Jimmy Carter. Right. But it was all state control. And anyone can tell you that education is better uh, produced and better uh, uh, afforded and controlled by the, the more local it is. Ideally, you want it all local. That's very useful. Except when you're talking about things like segregated schools. I mean, there's right. a reason that we had the federal mandate to desegregate the schools because yeah. the states were, especially in the South, but that would be extraordinarily slow to do that. Right, but that wasn't the Department of Education. No, that was the Department of Justice. But I noticed that Ron Paul's son Rand got into a little trouble with Rachel Maddow. He's another uh, quasi libertarian who's in the Republican Party. Right. right now, and he was really suggesting that the civil rights law was not necessary, that that was meddling by the federal government. And I think many African Americans felt that that was that old states' rights argument that so many of the Dixiecrats and the rock rib racists used in the South to make sure there was no change because they controlled local politics to the point that it would have been forever to get any of those laws changed. Right. Well, that's kind of a difficult point for him to explain. Uh, and uh, he was having trouble with that, but the, um, yeah, the federal, federal laws uh, that uh, William Johnson came up with for civil rights so were important. Um, so the libertarians would not have had a problem with that federal legislation. Well, some do, some do. Some don't. do, some don't. Okay. Uh, technically, you could say, <clears throat> well, it's my private property. I can allow uh, anyone on it that I want, or not allow anyone on it. I have business, I can choose to sell my product to whoever I want to. And I, yeah. the government can't force you to do this or do that. Unless, of course, it's public service. And obviously, it has to be provided for everyone equally. You're listening to WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing. We're talking with Will White of the Libertarian Party. Well, um, what do you think? Do uh, you think the Libertarians are getting really short shrift in this whole national debate right now we're having? I think the 99 percent of us are getting real short shrift. <laughs> are you a 99 percenter? Is the, are the libertarians 99 percenters? Oh, I would say uh, yeah. I mean, it's actually less than one percent. It's like half of one percent. And uh, yeah, we're all suffering from that. Uh, they control really the whole game. It's Wall Street and the government working in concert. It's corporate governance basically, and they rigged the game in elections. They rigged the game. In the press, they own all the press, and they uh, control the whole show. They control the debate. They control who becomes nominated. They control who gets press coverage. Yes. 
So it's a rigged game, and everybody sees that now. The 99 percenters, I think the Occupy Wall Street movement is a real wake-up call for a lot of people. That's something that the Libertarians and the Greens uh, and the, the other minor parties have been working for for 30, 40, well, the Libertarian Party will be 40 years old next year. So. Well, you know, the one area where I really parted company with the Libertarians in the past and that what made me such a committed Green was the issue of corporate governance. The idea that the Libertarians seemed to say that corporations of their own free will would work their way towards being uh, taking care of the environmental laws, that somehow they would know that that was ultimately bad for their business. I'm not persuaded of that, Will. I think that the corporations are, um, if we did not have this, what's left of our union movement in this country, we'd be looking at Foxconn type companies, the kind that we had in China, where 300 people were standing on the roof the other day threatening to throw themselves off and kill themselves because they've got 13 year old kids working 16 hour days, seven days a week for 70 cents an hour. Yeah. And that's what I'm afraid we'd have here if the corporations have their way. Well, there, uh, there has been a debate uh, amongst libertarians about that. Technically, theoretically, uh, capitalism uh, would do that. But the problem we have now is some of these corporations are so big, they're bigger than many states as far as their budget, their number of employees. They're bigger than many countries. They are. So when you get a multinational company like Coca-Cola or McDonald's, something like that, it actually has that much power and that much money to throw around, then you have a problem. The original corporations were very limited. You had to get yes. in a federal charter, and yeah. they had a specific purpose, like the uh, company that started trade with America. Um, what was the name of the, 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 the tea company? <laughs> yeah. Actually, it did have tea in it. Yeah, the uh, Atlantic and Pacific. No, 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 no the great. Yeah, but I know there was, it well, was a trading up, company, yes. Yeah, and you can look up the history of the uh, corporations. That's yeah. the, it was a corporation specifically chartered by the king right. to uh, take it, and they had their own little army, just like we have the corporate armies now, waging war for us. And that was who was fi fighting the uh, English or the Americans. The colonists, I should say, at the time they were Americans. Mm -hmm. And it was really the original Boston Tea Party wasn't because they raised taxes, it was because they lowered taxes. Oh. Uh, because the uh, taxes were so high on the imported tea the British were bringing in mm -hmm. that the black market of the colonists who were getting tea uh, under the radar, so to speak. Yeah. We're selling it cheaper because they weren't paying this high tax. So oh, then the, 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 the uh, um, English tea company found that out. Petitioned the king says, "Hey, you got to lower taxes to two cents." Oh, so we can compete. So we can compete with this uh, black market tea, and we'll wipe out those nice Americans over there. Right. Yeah. So the, the uh, American tea uh, the colonists found that out and threw out off uh, all this tea mm -hmm. so they could. Continue to make a uh, economic income. It was all economics, really. Yeah. As well as freedom. I shouldn't say all economics. But they, they didn't have the freedom to pursue their dreams without the uh, tax stamp or a tax on this or tax on that. And they had no representation to go to the king and say, this is unfair. Well, one thing I had never known about the libertarians is where they stand on international trade. High tariffs, no tariffs, completely free trade. What is the libertarian position on that? Uh, entangling alliances with non trade with all. And of course, every country is going to be different. Obviously, if one country is paying a large subsidy and inundating, inundating our shores with the product that's putting a lot of our people out of business, we would want to raise it and put up a tariff and say, hey, you're going to put, send all this, uh, dump all this cheap stuff here that your government is paying for it. We can't allow that. So there's a balance, you know, like, uh, at one time, uh, we didn't have any bananas. And so we took over oh, Central yes. America. And there was a war over yeah, there. Yeah, there was. The United Fruit Company had a little to say about that, didn't they? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, it's, uh, and go back to the history of the world. It's, it's always been about economics, free trade, and the so-called American dream, which is really a universal dream. Yeah. To have a good enough job to raise your family, you have a home, and hopefully your kids will have a, as good or better opportunity. 
and that, that's uh, all everybody wants. And, what interests me this year uh, uh, specifically is that I think some of the young people that were Obama people four years ago are now Ron Paul people this time. It seems that's where a lot of the young people's enthusiasm um, on campus, even at Michigan State. I don't hear many young people talk about Obama, but there's a committed group that is talking about Ron Paul. Now, admittedly, I think two of the things they really like about Ron Paul are, number one, he legalized dope, and there's a, plenty of those who say, hey, that wouldn't be all bad. And the second group, I think, are young men who are very happy to think there will be no draft and no wars, that Ron Paul would be in a libertarian position is really to pull back. We have 900 garrisons around the world now. Um, it was only 700 a decade ago. We're just expanding all over the place with this uh, military muscle around the world. So the libertarians would pretty much pull that back. Oh, well, definitely, yeah. It's uh, not so, so much of non interventionist, but uh, that's. I mean, a good way to understand it. Basically, you defend the shores. You don't go out and meddle with other people's business. And in fact, uh, Ron Paul's contributions from the military, those active and retired, yes. are more than all the other candidates combined. That's fascinating. And he has a large uh, amount of support in the military. Because they know they're, they're over there fighting wars. Why do we have an army uh, protecting Germany? From Russia, right. for example. Right. Why do we have an army in Japan? They can, uh, they're our trade uh, enemies. We're fighting for, with them for trade, yet we're subsidizing their defense. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, like you said, there's about 163 garrisons around the world and some. 900. Some crazy thing, yeah. yeah. And our military budget is as much as the next, what, 20 countries combined? I mean, it's uh, astounding when you pay a lot of money. Anytime they start talking about cutting that social security, they say, come on up. Take, pull back a little battle loop somewhere. Well, How they, would um, libertarians have dealt with the whole foreclosure crisis? What, what would have been oh, the that's strategy? A, that's a good question, Bill. Well, uh, most libertarians would say if they were uh, in charge to begin with, it would never have happened. But ah. they, they, uh, there was a breakdown in, in uh, enforcement um, when uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, signed the uh, law that uh, ended the Glass uh, Glass Eagle Glass Eagles Act. That basically allowed Wall Street to gamble with everybody else's money, and then when they lose, we pay it. Yes, and it's socialized losses and capitalist gains. There you go. They make money, they keep it, and if they lose money, it's the taxpayer. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, most libertarians were on the side of bailing out the uh, people that got the bad mortgages and not the banks. And so, uh, yeah. They're the ones that caused the problem. I mean, obviously there was some fraud and some people said, oh, I can get a house by just signing this paper and not giving you any money at all to begin with and it's only $300 a month. Sure, I'll do it. Sure. Especially when it's going up in value every year so much. Right. But then obviously most of those people were suckered into the deal. Yeah. And, uh, it's just uh, people, uh, the one percent, figuring out uh, the best way to make more money and faster. And uh, they're doing some good things. I mean, they're still investigating. There was a lot of fraud. Now people need to go to jail. They need to get that law back on the books that uh, does not allow all these uh, crazy derivative type trading where they even the people saw them don't even understand it. And I can verify that. A good friend of mine helped create them, and he said. He couldn't explain them to you. Yeah, any loan or any transfer should have some physical piece of uh, mm -hmm. property that goes with it. And okay. it should be trackable. I mean, it's, it's so convoluted now with packages and packages and packages and packages and selling them for national. It's a ridiculous uh, complex of numbers that only a few people think they understand and they don't. Forced me to learn the word tranche, which I'd never heard before, where they yeah. slice and dice these mortgages into little pieces and sell them off, little packages of them. Yeah. But some of the um, national level issues may be different than what the Michigan Libertarian Party's focus is. You've been working a lot on voter reform. Right. Well, that's a national issue as well as, well okay. as a state issue. But really, uh, all national issues are state issues too, to a certain extent. Because a lot of them have been taken over by the federal government that shouldn't have been. Like the Department of Education, like the Department of Commerce, like the um, FAA, and the FDA, and all of those. And the state uh, 
different state organizations work together and when you build enough momentum, then you can get the national problem solved. That's pretty apparent what's what happening with the medical marijuana law. Why is that? And that's what happened with the uh, women's right to vote law. Yeah. And the, uh, a lot of the old laws that got changed over the years. Uh, the prohibition law, yeah. for example, on alcohol. After a while, in so many states that uh, passed laws were making it basically ineffective, but the federal government finally had to act in this and One of the things we're seeing nationwide now, especially in states with Republican governors, are all of these attempts to quote unquote root out voter fraud as if it were a big problem. <laughs> And a lot of the legislation that's pending to do that, requiring all sorts of photo IDs issued by the government and so forth, is really putting a burden on people, and it's going to reduce the vote coming up the next time. And that has real implications for third parties, I believe. Well, it has a, yes, definitely. Uh, the lower the voter turnout is, the better the Republican Party does, and the worse the Democrats and other minor parties do. Uh, the real voter fraud is not people voting illegally, it's the people counting the votes electronically. That's where the voter fraud is. There have been several stolen elections, both local, state, and federal. And it's because the election process now is gone to computers that are controlled by two, one or two major companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And they change their names so they don't seem like they're the same guys. <laughs> But they, uh, in, uh, in many places, the uh, person actually, the, the official running the election has no knowledge of the computer system. And they hire, they private, it's been privatized, they hire a firm, okay, we're from Google, or whatever, right. we're here to count the votes, they put a chip in the computer, they send it out to the county, okay, here's your vote total, here's who won. Well, we just saw the Iowa caucuses, which ought to be pretty easy to count. You've got real people there who are sitting yeah, there. Yeah, that's much more reliable, actually. One would think so, except that what we found out was that Mitt Romney did not win, and Rick Santorum did. They changed that up, what, about a week later? And on top of which, there are some precincts that they still say they'll never get votes from. So you have to really wonder. I mean, I, I was trying to sound like a banana republic here. Well, that was a caucus, so that was run by the party for the party. Well, that's true. So it doesn't really have any official yeah. legal consequences, whereas other primary states, it is run by the state and they should be accountable. Mm -hmm. The Detroit mayoral race uh, last time was a fiasco, was of course. Uh, there were so many damaged uh, ballots, uh, missing uh, seals and uh, complications, they, they ordered a recount because it was so close, but they could not recount it. Mm -hmm. Impossible recount. And a lot of recounts, when they say, okay, we want to recount the vote, all they do is run the ballots through the same machine and they get the same result. Of course. So you really need to go back to hand count audits. And that was, this is one of the primary things that the Michigan Election Reform Alliance is working on. Mira.org, if you want to visit the website, mira.org. And there's a whole bill of rights for voters that uh, we're working on. But the primary one is election count audits, so you can see if the machines are active. You've got to have that paper trail. If you don't have that paper trail, you can go back and see what the votes really were. They never know for sure. Right. And I think we've all had experience enough with electronics to know that's the case. Well, there was a representative of Debold who testified in front of John Connors. There was a YouTube clip of it out there, and he talked about how he was part of a group that was working on subverting the machines. And somehow we've never heard about it that ever since. I mean, there it is. You can watch him testify in front of Congress, but nothing much ever happened to that clip. Well, that's because guess who runs the media? Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's on YouTube. One of the things I should, in closing, say is that um, the Libertarian Party, for those who are interested, is going to have a real celebrity, Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico, who is likely to become the Libertarian presidential candidate this year. If you can't lure Ron Paul, when I'm afraid he's going to get squeezed out and he's not going to beat Mitt or Newt, I suspect. And if you can't get him, then you're probably going to be looking at Gary Johnson, who's quite famous for standing up there at some of those Republican presidential debates and talking about legalizing marijuana and it was interesting to see you know more than one person voting for that and uh arguing for that. So you have your Liberty Fest coming up in March on March tenth out in Hope. What's a Liberty Fest? Well that's where the Libertarian minded community gets together and 
his awards to the uh, outstanding Liberty Canyons who inspires communicating Liberty and uh, mm -hmm. presenting Liberty and promoting Liberty. Those are the three categories. So they don't have a dump tank. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like no. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we used to have it uh, right after the election, so it was kind of like a post election party, but we uh, moved around to different time space. But the uh, Libertarian Party, like I said earlier, is going to be 40 years old next year. And wow. And I think uh, we've been around long enough. We've had a pretty good impact on a lot of things nationwide, you know, just kind of under the radar. I think you're becoming really part of the discussion now, the way that you yeah. went before. It's, it's, it's like the you know, uh, Occupy. Yeah. You know, it's all of a sudden part of any discussion that goes on, I mean, uh, it's also... What's your website so people who want more information can find you? Well, the national site is lp.org. Okay. LibertarianParty.org. The state uh, is mi.lp.org. Okay. And our local party is C-A-L Party. <laughs> if you send them to me, I promise to post them on the yeah. online news. Cal Party, Capital Area Libertarian Party. Ah. One quick question: Are you for or against the casino in Lansing? As a libertarian, I guess. Well, uh, the Native Americans uh, have their uh, opportunity; they should take it. I mean, you know, it's gambling to a limit to the, the state. If, if you're gonna, if the state's going to be allowed to gamble. Why shouldn't private enterprise? Okay, so that's a, that's on the side of liberty. They get yeah. to do what they want to do. Yeah, if the people vote it in, you know, it should be up to these people of the city of Lansing and not just the politicians, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of ramifications with that. You know, it's, you know, just like alcohol it can be a troublesome problem. Some counties are dry in Michigan still. Some counties are wet. And uh, that's the way it should be, the local control of, of your... Uh, yeah, but see, with too much local control, they have to keep moving. <laughs> yeah. that, that's part of the liberty. That's why the West was developed. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us, Will, and educating thank you. us about the Libertarian Party. This is WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We're now going to be joined by Fred Carger, who is, hey, we have, I mean, we have a clue here. We have a presidential candidate, and he's accompanied by Todd Haywood. Um, with the American Independent uh, Network. News Network. News Network. A-I-N-N. -N. Which, which is not owned by massive corporations. No. No, no we're a non-profit agent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thought we'd point that out. <laughs> you're not, so you're not getting any of those hefty uh, political dollars. You're not getting part of that $16 million that, I wish. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Fred, you are a candidate for the presidency of the United States on the GOP ticket. But why have we been not been seeing you on that stage? Why are you were you not there giving Duda a hard time and Rick a hard time and all of those people a hard time? I had hoped to be there. I had uh, was the first to file with the Federal Election Commission last uh, March in Washington D.C. and I had been invited to the South Carolina debate, the very first one. But there was a catch, and that was I would have had to have been in five national polls. At one percent or higher. Well, I'd only been in one poll at that time, and it's, you know we're looking at about a dozen candidates back in March, so they needed to eliminate four of us. So the second debate by Fox in Ames, Iowa, I did meet their qualifications. I you did. did. I did. I had six national polls. I was at one percent or higher. And what did Fox do? Change they changed the rules, the rules on yeah. me. So I took them to the Federal Election Commission, which I've done on one other occasion when I've been wrong. And what happened? Well. I asked the FEC to expedite their decision because the next year you laugh. <laughs> that's what my attorney did. Their idea of expediting it was different is than here. Mine. We sit in, you know, almost February. That was about seven months ago, and um, I've not heard squat. And they don't do much at the FEC. I didn't know much about it, but there are six commissioners, three Republicans, three Democrats, and apparently that's designed by Congress, so they don't do anything. They can never make a decision. It takes four to come up with something. So um, I did. Sir Rupert Murdoch and Fox News Corp with a 158-page complaint at News Corp offices in Washington and sent the original to the FEC, and we're just waiting to hear. You should have hacked his phone. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to work. It I, seems think, to work. I think he beat me to the punch. <laughs> now, tell us why it is that you're running and why it is that you think you maybe are not being included. Are you uh, espousing some positions that you think maybe mainstream Republicans are not in sync with yet? 
Well, you know, it, um, it's been a, a rocky road for me. I've been in politics my whole life. I worked as a professional for 30 years with a consulting firm who ran political campaigns. I worked on nine presidential campaigns. I worked on dozens more, governor, senate, local, school board, you name it. And um, I always wanted to be a candidate. And, like, I always wanted to get married to the person I love. But uh, being gay, both of those were prohibited. So I just got used to second-class citizenship. Uh, suddenly, I came out of the closet about you know, three and a half years ago really? in a big way. I've always been gay, but I always kept it kind of on the DL. Yes, and, on the down uh, low. On the down low as a Republican political operative and most Democrat political operatives, too. I mean, it was a pretty new phenomenon that we could come out, with, you know, in, in the world. And uh, a lot of my friends who were, you know, there were a lot of Democrat campaigns, same situation. But on Prop 8, I came out. I became very aggressive against the opponents of Prop 8. Uh, or the supporters of Prop 8, rather, the opponents of gay married, boycotted them, uh, covered the Mormon church, and all this. So I got a lot of attention and, um, and came out of the closet publicly. And once my secret was out, the door was open to me for run, to run for office. And I, I decided to start at the top I guess, and run um, for president. For your first campaign, Rob, what does it take to, how do you become a presidential candidate? What does it cost? Where do you file? You know, it's pretty easy, That's actually. What I um, the, the catch is what we were just talking about, the filing of campaign reports with our Federal Election Commission, which become very onerous. Um, you have, need to be 35 or over, a natural-born citizen. You're not from Kenya? I'm, no, no, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another one of those Chicago people. Watch out for the they Chicago. Haven't, they haven't made that yet. Maybe. It's coming. And... Um, and you need to have been a resident of the country for the last 14 years. And I have been for 61 years. So you walk in or you can do it by mail, the Federal Election Commission. It's free. And you can become a federal candidate for president. A couple hundred of us. Uh, well, the same rules apply for establishing a super PAC. Yes. <laughs> do you have a super PAC? Uh, I, if anyone's listening out there, I would welcome one. But uh, no, I don't. And, um, I'm actually a major... Um, campaign finance reformer and believe in full disclosure and transparency. The question that I have for you, and I don't mean to be uh, uh, rude about it, but it's sort of like seeing somebody who's openly gay try to become a leader in the Republican Party is sort of like suggesting an African-American trying to take over the KKK. I mean, uh, I've read enough David Brock. Uh, he was... Again, someone who was closeted at the time that he worked with a lot of Republican candidates and was a staffer to many people and uh, involved in those circles. And he ultimately got to the point where he was revulsed by the sort of attitudes, anti-gay attitudes that are seem to be so rampant in the party. Um, doesn't Isn't it time to become a Democrat? Run, as, run the Democratic nomination? You know, I've thought about it. And I, I live in Southern California, but I have been fighting the Republican Party from within for my entire life. I grew up in Chicago. I worked for Charles Percy. Who was Did a you very, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, I worked wow. on his first governor's race at 14. I used to ride my bike. He'd be a Democrat now. You know, <laughs> I would be liberal. liberal. Yeah, liberal Democrat. He was very progressive. He was. Were, you know, a lot of the governors, senators from the Midwest and yeah. Northeast. And everything has changed. And you know, you know who I blame for this is uh, Strom Thurmond, Jesse Helms, some of the dissatisfied Dixiecrats, Democrats from the South after the Civil Rights Bill Absolutely. passed. They came over to the Republican Party and wrecked it because it was, you know, a very different um, situation where the Democratic Party, particularly like a hundred years ago, you know, Woodrow Wilson came to the presidency, fired all the African Americans that Theodore Roosevelt, the progressive Republican president, right. had brought in. So. You know, it's cyclical. I'm a fighter, and I believe in change from within. It would be very easy for every you know, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender person to leave the Republican Party and go to the Democratic Party. But then we've seen what happens. That when suddenly we're taken for granted. I think it's important that the Republican Party not throw people out, but, but broaden its base, have that big tent, welcome everybody in. I've been campaigning nonstop for two years spending an inordinate amount of time, by choice, of course, at colleges and universities. And I've been welcomed by the highest levels of the Republican Party, from Reince Priebus, the chairman, met me with me in his office, and the vice chair, and the chief of staff. With the shades drawn? <laughs> he, was, he was, you know, I talked to the um, Daily Call, I mean, I talked to the Hill, the big Russian publication right afterwards, with, with big news there. So the day before I filed with the FEC, and he welcomed me. And one of the reasons is, I think, is because 
he wants to bring younger people in the party, reach out to students. You know, we're going to be a, a dead party, which will make a lot of people happy, but but it needs to be, a, we need a two-party system, and I think we need a Republican Party that reflects a lot of American views, which are in the center. The Republican Party does seem to be on a suicide mission, because if they alienate all African Americans, all Hispanics, the entire LGBT community, it seems to me that they can't survive as a viable party over the next few decades, and it's, uh, so I mean, I, I guess it makes sense to try to reform from within. Um, one of the questions that I had for you, though, is that uh, are you uh, supported by the Law Cabin Republicans? Are they uh, fund, helping to fund your campaign? Um, are they a powerful force in the party? Uh, no, you know, no. it's that old gay Republican. There aren't many of us. Uh, and law, Little Law Cabin, which started in my hometown of Laguna Beach, California in 1978 after the Briggs Initiative, which would have banned all gay teachers in California. And they started up and I'd worked actually separately, not with them, but to make that a very bipartisan effort. We eventually got Ronald Reagan to come out and oppose that, which completely flipped the polls from two to one supporting it to two to one opposing it. And they're just not that strong. They've okay. got a national presence. They don't endorse in the primary, but far and away, they've been the biggest Fred Carter supporters out there. Their chapters, I've gotten individual contributions. I've spoken to their national convention, their dinners. Um, and been to many of their chapter meetings and have gotten some money from some of them. Um, but they don't have a lot of resources. And it's difficult because the LGBT community is predominantly Democratic and very progressive. And while I am very socially progressive and, and the only full equality candidate running, including President Obama, you know, I have a hard time getting anybody to write a check to a Republican. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I do get a lot of messages and email messages. I've never voted for Republican before I'm going to vote for you. I've never contributed to Republican before I'm going to vote for you. And it's important, I think, that we have a two-party system. You're listening to WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. But what are you going to do when you're here in Michigan? Are you going to be here a few days, or how long are you going to be here? Well, um, I got in on uh, last Thursday. I'm staying till Wednesday. I've been, you know, it'll be a week, and then I'm coming back after I go to Washington for the CPAC convention, um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which we want to get to. It's not as bad as it sounds, but and then I'm coming back here for about three weeks before the February 20th primary. primary. I did this in New Hampshire, and I had a lot more time there, and so on a smaller state, and I was successful in that primary. I beat Michelle Bachman by 135 votes. Did you? I did. I'm very proud of it. I'd set a goal of beating her or Santorum, and he caught on fire the week before in Iowa, so I did not beat him, but I came very close to Rick Perry, who had been in you know, 15 debates at that point, spent $25 million, and just hard work and perseverance and wow. no retail politics. So I want to do that. As much as I can in this four week window here in Michigan. Do you suffer the problem that when the national media, do they pay any attention to you at all, number one? And number two, if they do, do they just want to ask uh, um, limited questions? And I mean, what, what kind of questions do they ask you? Do they care? Well, it's very interesting. You know, I'm, I, I'm a fighter, as I mentioned. I persevere. So I, I've been kind of in the trenches working very hard. Uh, about exactly a year ago, it was mid January, I was in Washington. I get an email and it said, we would like to cover your campaign and come to New Hampshire with you for, for three days. Signed, Dan Zach, Washington Post. Wow. And, and I was at dinner. I actually had to walk outside because <laughs> I was so flustered that I was wondering, am I ready for the Washington Post to spend three days with me? And I met with many, many reporters over coffee or in their office. But, you know, three days, they see all your faults and blemishes. Well, um, we've been working for a year in New Hampshire. So he came out. Kevin Miniter, who's our New Hampshire coordinator and research director, part of our six-member Lean Mean Fighting Machine campaign staff, put together an extraordinary tour in colleges and radio shows and town hall meetings and you name it. And Dan Zach came out. And, you know, <laughs> it was a nerve-wracking time for me. Rode with us for three days and wrote an incredible two-full-page feature oh, on me in the Washington Post. Well, that changed everything. Oh, it did it. Yeah. And suddenly... The international media, the um, Guardian, I met with Paul Harris in New York. He emailed me and said, I see you're going to be in New York on my website schedule. Can we have lunch? Well, he did an incredible profile without the three days, just a lunch. But, you know, that then triggered all this international media. Between those two pieces, everything for me changed. It can make all the difference. And, yeah, it did. From, you know, getting on BBC, I was on a show. They invited me over. I went to London to take a called Hard Talk with uh, Stephen Sacker. It's the... 
you know, Meet the Press on steroids. It's their one big show, and I was the first presidential candidate on it. Just like our war room, Jennifer and I. <laughs> it's why we always, you know, you don't get to hear Noam Chomsky in this country. In fact, he talks about the fact he was invited a few times by NPR, then they uninvite him before it's time for him to appear, but he's big in Europe. European press is where I go for my American news these days. Well, they're, they're, you know, very progressive. They've taken a like me. I've been, you know, any number of, of international publications featured quite heavily in Great Britain. I, I did a BBC show called Night Talk, which is kind of Nightline. I did that live from New Hampshire with, uh, Selinda Lake, big Democratic poster. Well, so the, the international media has been intrigued. And then I've gotten a tremendous amount of coverage here. I have yet to be on CNN and yet to be on Fox, but everything else, MSNBC, um, the other channels, Go chat with Rachel ABC. She'll have Trump. She's had me on. I was, oh, good. And I encouraged I missed this. you. I, I thought I watched her every night. She's had me on quite a few times, ah. actually, and I'm a huge fan. Yeah. And, um, I've only been interviewed on it once, but she's she's uh, referred to me many, many oh. times, and I I did a an investigation I uh, underwent of Mitt Romney's residency and all these kind of conflicting. I know it's hard to believe. How many homes does he have? What, he's 15, got three. 19? He's got the three, but he claimed he was living in his son's basement. So right. he vote for Scott Brown. Well, I'm the guy that uncovered that. And she had a oh, field day with that. And, um, and anyway, we've been having a good time with that. And it's a serious violation. And it, it goes to his untruthfulness. He just... Uh, you know, he sits there or stands there in debates and just, you know, tells complete falsehoods. Well, maybe you have an answer to the one question I can't get. He keeps talking about how, well, my father was born in Mexico. Well, then how did your father run for president? <laughs> I mean, he his, ran for president here in Michigan. He did. Yeah, and George. Was it did. George Lai? No, it was kind of, it's kind of like the uh, McCain scenario where he was born in Panama, but his father was in a federal base. Federal base, oh, federal base except his parents were Americans who... Fled, of course, polygamy. Polygamy, yeah, yeah. It's not a military base. No, no, but they were they were naturalized citizens. Yeah. So even though he was born in Mexico, he was born to American oh. parents. Even I don't know how many of them. I didn't know there was that little asterisk. <laughs> so when you say that you're socially <laughs> progressive, <laughs> baseball home run. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. What would little asterisk on the record? Feel the no, whole baseball said, team. Yeah, he said he, he was in trouble for his brainwashing comment kind of, after being born absolutely. I was wondering, when you say you're socially progressive, but you're a Republican, it's the fiscal issues that make you still have the pull to the Republican Party? A few others. I'm, you know, I'm a tough law and order guy. I'm way, way pro-choice, absolutely. Well, that'll, yeah, yeah, we'll never get a... Okay, we've we've done a commercial in New Hampshire and a mailer. We're going to be doing the same thing here. I say that I'm pro-choice, that I'm, you know, for full marriage equality, gay mm-hmm. marriage. I'm, I want to end the war in Afghanistan now. And so... On those issues, I'm progressive, but I still believe in, you know, personal empowerment, which I think, you know, not government, that people should have that ability, and I believe in strong national defense, but I believe in a smaller, So big government. So big government to chop my social security? Uh, no. Um, no. And I, you know, what the modern part of me is that caring, that Charles Percy and Rockefeller, all these kind of Republicans that I grew up with, believe government should do, and that's what I'm a firm believer in. But we need to live within our means. We cannot continue on the spending spree without some adjustments. And that includes revenue enhancement. Everything is on the table. You sound like you're to the left of Obama. I am in many areas. I think you probably are. At, at Much to my surprise, by the way. Those yeah. of us who invested enormous yeah. amounts of time in the Obama campaign, we're not as happy to find out. No, I've seen a lot of When he ran last time, I probably would have gone down to see him at the University of Michigan. Oh, yeah, hmm. but not this time. this time. I'm not the only one that's, not, that's making those kind of decisions. Now, do you, are you popular with young people? Are young people in the party? I think of someone like Meghan McCain as the future of the uh, GOP. I mean, she's uh, much... <laughs> yeah, Meghan McCain? Uh, yeah, I know who she is. Actually. Yeah, I mean, she seems to me to be much more liberal than the rest of the party. She seems to be trying to get young people involved in the party. She'd like to keep moving, and she has some power being the nominee's daughter. She gets a platform. So I'm just wondering, is that the future of the Republican Party? You think the pendulum will swing? Yes, I love her comments, and I love her voice and energy. Um, that's what we need. You know, when you look at some of the Republicans, particularly on an issue near and dear to me, you know, gay marriage, uh, you know, she's a huge advocate. Her mother, you know, yes. came out, yeah. not just for gay marriage, but no hate. Right. You know, I mean, very aggressive. And so, have, you know, some of the others, the Laura Bushes, a lot of the women, which is where our strength is in our civil rights movement, are with women in America. The you know straight men are 
a little slower to come around, but the women, their wives and sisters and girlfriends and daughters and mothers, I hope will talk some sense into them. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the Republican Party does have a future. When I started as a young Republican in 1976, I think about, it was two years after Watergate, and we were going to college campuses with messages like, you know, legalize marijuana, become a young Republican. We had a very aggressive, progressive actions back then because it was worse than now. I mean, Nixon wrecked it. Well, in comes Ronald Reagan six years later, this older man, and somehow he just lit a fire under younger people, high school and college students, and it became cool again what? to become a Republican. <laughs> you I don't do remember it. You know, I, <laughs> I remember calling him Ronnie Reagan. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, it was completely different. Apparently, from, hung out in different circles. That's then. true. <laughs> no, he, he brought younger people back, and you know, and that's what Ron Paul is doing now. And I tip my hat to him. We're talking about that CPAC. The first time I went there, which was two years ago, I expected a bunch of old women with funny hats, and I'm used to seeing it, all conservative guys. things. Yeah, tea party. Well, it was now it's all these young, sharp people, guys and girls, suits, and you know, look at and these were Ron Paul supporters from colleges and universities and high schools, and they were taking buses and hitchhiking and how getting to Washington however they could. And I commended him at a speech. He wasn't there, but his son was. I spoke to the same platform as Rick Santorum and, and Newt Gingrich at the Hillsborough County, I know, it was right dinner. And, and Ram spoke too, Ram Paul. And, you know, that's what we need. Some people to go after the younger voters. And Are you an Ayn Rand fan? <laughs> not, no, not necessarily. Okay, because that's the that's where I know that's a libertarian icon in some cases. And, uh, a, tea, and a tea party, and a tea party yeah. icon. And it, uh, kind of, I mean, when it comes to sort of fiscal conservatism, that's where they need the I part company with them. It's this idea, yes, personal responsibility, but the idea that you don't really have any care or compassion for others. That's that's what I would go to that. Well, let's see. Yeah, Ron is pull. My grandpa wants to just pull out the support system of what churches do it. I know what he's got. Some he's trying to be a strict libertarian. But relying no on government. private charity, boy, I have news for you. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people. They're not that charitable. <laughs> <laughs> you can choose who to be charitable with. If I was in need of some food, I think going to the back door with a beggar bowl, I'd be in big trouble. I'd weigh a lot less than I do. So I'm not all that keen on you. So you're gonna go down to CPAC? Is Todd gonna to be your your bodyguard? Or? Well, I'm actually gonna ask a question because coming in, Fred told me that he's got some news breaking here about yeah. CPAC. So Fred, why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about what's going on? Well, the CPAC is the um, annual convention of the Conservative Political Action Conference, or yeah. Union rather. It's uh, it's now headed by Al Cardenas, who's a former Republican chairman from Florida, very very conservative guy. Two years ago, I went for my very first time, again, was surprised with all the young people. It's a prerequisite for all Republican candidates for president. All were invited last year except me, um, and I... You weren't invited? I was not invited to speak, and I was not invited to you know, be a co-sponsor, so I applied. And I uh, do what I do, and I sent in my credit card and followed up. And, oh, we're all full. This was in early January when I got my notice. We were all full. It's not for five weeks. I had other people tell me they had applied for just to rent a booth in their trade show, which is several hundred exhibitors. We had 10,000 people at this thing and a lot of media. And so they said that, um, no, no, um, we're full for you, I guess. But they were letting others, like Gary Johnson, who uh, was a Republican running for president, now is a libertarian candidate. Mm -hmm. And he was so nice, he let me use half his booth. Oh, really? Yeah, oh. class act. Great guy. And so I was um, uh, very impressed. And he read it as after mine. So I figured, okay, this year I'm going to get a leg up on them. I'm going to apply way early. So <laughs> when the applications became available for a trade show booth, I applied in November. Lo and behold, they're happy to take my credit card. Well, they found out who I was. And they pulled the plug again, never responded to me. And, um, and then I just got to a reporter who I complained to. I just got word that, no, no, they're not. Uh, it's all full again. And they're not inviting anyone who wasn't a sponsor last year. So I, I threatened that I, every time I make a threat, I will follow through with it. I will be filing with the Washington DC Human Rights Commission. Absolutely. Because I'm thinking Washington DC, you cannot prohibit someone from exhibiting in a public facility because he happens to be gay. You he must have to go around with a lawyer watching every move just to keep him on retainer. Well, I try and use government. Oh, okay. And it's a lot cheaper. Oh, it is. And yeah. it's a lot more threatening. Than I bet it is. 
and I fall two FEC complaints. I it seems to me a profit status. It seems to me it'd be easier to let you in. Right. And that's just that? a yeah. dumb strategy to keep But then you you'd out. have to watch Rush Limbaugh dance in front of the microphone like he did the last time. <laughs> God, that was one of the most obnoxious things I've ever seen. If that man jiggles in places I didn't know I had places. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you sure you want to go? Yeah, I want to go. A lot of media there. I'd love to speak, and they turned me down on that too. They they have a no gays allowed policy. There's this group, Goat Proud, which is kind yeah. of like Log Cabin, mm -hmm. that got got in, I think. And it, it was two years ago, and that surprised me because they were allowed to have a booth because they got in there in a sponsorship and they take take the money. Well, Lombo got four of these right wing groups like the Family Research Council, oh, how bad. American Family Association, no one hate groups, yeah. pronounced hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center. They said, we're boycotting. You can't have a gay group there. And I thought, well, there goes Go Proud. Well, then a different leader was, was heading it up and he allowed them there. And I don't know what happened with these groups. I think they finally kind of came around. Well, then the second year, last year, they were back. Big flap again. So they made a no gays allowed decision. And that's no why that's absolutely true. Really true. So it's publicly stated. Yeah. It's the, not cool. What they've said is, you know, Go Proud is not welcome here. Uh, gay Republicans are not welcome here. Anybody who's going to be Advertising has to be pro-traditional marriage, and I mean it's 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 a huge issue, hmm. um, particularly with with gay Republicans and gay conservatives, which Michigan has a significant pocket of. Um, if the party is so keen to purge the entire LGBT community, though, I mean, is it something you could really fight against? Well, this is not the party I've actually. Okay. I've been welcomed by the party from all these state parties. I've spoken at county parties. I was over at the Wayne County. Uh, 15th district, which I guess was their last meeting since we lost the 15th district here. But I spoke up there with a Republican state senator, a Republican state house member, um, you know, pro gun, anti gay marriage, but they welcomed me. And, you know, that's what I've been getting all over the country. It's these third party groups. It's, you know, Gary Bauer, this kind of, um, uh, the Family Educators. Research Council. Yeah, they're the ones that, you know, Feel they don't have to, to obey the law. Well, they're gonna they're gonna be in big trouble because there's a mandatory arbitration <clears throat> along with my complaint with this Washington State Human Rights Commission. So, a person that has never seen this trade floor, what would they expect on this trade floor? It must mm -hmm. be pretty unique. You know, it's it's actually not. It's just a lot of you know vendors trying to sell things to buttons, sell things yeah, to ten thousand people, yeah. and it's a very influential group because. You get all these all the national and international media, and they've always had the presidential candidates. Reagan is the guy who really gave them the credibility because he went there when he ran in 1980, and suddenly then it's a must do on the presidential candidate circuit. But you know, it's it's um, it's going to be in Virginia next year, by the way. Actually, when I think about it, though, it's almost uh, refreshing to go up against a group like CPAC that is openly adversarial. I think the group that bothers me the most are the people on Capitol Hill who have gay staffers, openly gay staffers, and they're very, I mean, they're an integral part of their team, and they're very wonderful to them, and they're very enlightened people, and then they go and feed some red meat to the gays, and they say things that are truly repulsive, and they really leave the LGBT community forced to listen to that, that is really disturbing. Is there, isn't that the group that kind of drives you nuts the most? I mean, uh, people that smile to your face and they work with you well, but then they're sort of standing in the back when you need a few words. Not too fond of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun to go after. I've done many. You know, I got the Mormon Church investigated in California, prosecuted, mm. fined on 13 counts, and they had to plead guilty to election fraud. Wow. Because they had spent so much time and money on Prop 8 and the National Organization mm -hmm. for Marriage. I uncovered their involvement, that they are a front group for the Mormon Church and now the Catholic Church. I went to Maine. I filed a complaint against them in their election, Amendment 1, to take away gay marriage there in 2009, after a year after I brought the Mormon Church up on charges. Well, they were uh, voted 3 to 2 to investigate, be investigated by the Maine Ethics Commission. It's in its third year right now. So I love going after these groups that are very, very suspect. We could have some serious charges against Maggie Gallagher and Brian Fred, Brown. Uh, we're coming up to the close. I really hope, I'm looking forward to in March seeing you in one of these debates. I know there's going to be kind of a lull in February, but I'm really eager. I'm hoping you get your chance to debate, and I hope that we get a chance to hear more from you. Uh, next week, we will be having Ray Holman of the UAW in to talk about some of the uh, concerns that he has with upcoming bills in the legislature that are going to affect the union.
It's WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Lansing Online News. Thank you very much. See you next week. Click and click. Life is good. It's still saying stuff.